Hi, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman here on True Crime MTN, and I'm joined again with our friend Melba Pearson, attorney extraordinaire, former prosecutor, former ACLU attorney. Welcome back, Melba. Thanks, Dave. Always good to be on with you. Yes, we have quite a doozy today. This is the case of George Allen Kelly. He's the rancher in Arizona who shot and killed Gabriel Quinn Butamea. He was an undocumented uh, immigrant who was on the rancher's property, but 100 yards away from him. And uh, this rancher has a huge, sprawling property. It's something like 160-plus acres. And he got his long rifle and shot and killed uh, Mr. Butamea as part of a group of migrants who were on his property. And, of course, Kelly said, no, I, I wasn't trying to, to kill him. I, I was just shooting over their head as a warning shot. And I did it as self-defense because Butamea was shooting or the group was shooting at me. But then he changed the story to say that the uh, shots were heard, but th they weren't coming at him. So it really seems like a very dubious claim of self-defense here. Uh, what's your overall view, Melba? Same, Dave, same, because he gave so many, and he being the defendant, gave so many conflicting statements and also the logic of this, right? Because you can't leave your common sense at the door if you are on a jury, right? And especially as a prosecutor or a defense attorney, you want to make sure that whatever you're saying is based in common sense. And one of his statements was basically to say that there was some sort of drug shootout as if this was, you know, Griselda Blanco in her prime and, you know, that there's this shootout between drug mules or whatever the case may be, which the prosecutor was very clear to rebut in her direct examination of the first responding uh, police officer to the scene were basically like, so these types of gun exchanges or gun battles around drugs, that's not common in our community and in this county, right? And the officer was very clear to say, absolutely not. So again, the defendant's statement doesn't hold water. It doesn't make sense. And additionally, when you look at the uh, autopsy report, it shows that the, the trajectory of the bullet went through his right on his right side behind his shoulder blade, which again indicates that he had his back to the defendant when he was shot. So theoretically, he was shooting someone that was fleeing or trying to get away, which again does not help his position that, oh, this was self defense because why are you scared if the person has their back to you? Yeah, it doesn't seem like self defense when you don't have any weapons found uh, around the victims. They they were on the property. They were trespassing. The uh, The rancher here has had previous instances where people have traveled on his property, and he clearly was angry about it. He shares some very uh, backward views of on uh, race, apparently, and uh, he, very uh, inflammatory language he's used. For example, he referred to Mr. Butamea as an animal when he uh, told police about the, the death on his property. He kept referring to him as an animal. I mean, that's a kind of language that gets into his mindset that perhaps it wasn't about self-defense, more about animus. And I think his best chance of getting away with it would be what's called jury nullification, which is where the jury of local residents on the jury who are also possibly fed up with illegal immigration and border policies decide to give him a pass. Now, that would be violating their oath as jurors where you're supposed to follow the evidence and the law, but it happens. It's a prosecutor's worst nightmare, jury nullification. And the defense did seem to be able to hang um, their hat on the forensics, as you mentioned, because in court, they tried to create some reasonable doubt saying, well, the way that the bullet exited through his chest uh, could be consistent with a uh, something that's other than a long rifle, something that's other than being shot from 100 yards away. Perhaps this was a drug deal gone bad. This was something where the group shot each other because... Uh, they were involved in the various things. The problem is there's, there was no there were no weapons found on the scene. So he's like, perhaps the defense is trying to find a boogeyman here to say, well, yeah, you know, there were some evil drug dealers and they shot and then they ran away. Uh, the defense attorney uh, noted how storing the victim's body in a cooler, which is what happened, would impact the ability to estimate his time of death. So perhaps he died not because of the 
long rifle here, but because of something else. So this is what defense lawyers are used to doing. You try to create some reasonable doubt. I don't think there is reasonable doubt here, but if a juror wants to engage in jury nullification, they've got some reason to now. Yeah, I mean, jury nullification is a real awful thing. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that folks can, you know, they, they may have frustrations around current border policy or uh, just current events generally. And they're like, yeah, I understand where the defendant is coming from. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I would have done the same thing if I was in his shoes. I'm tired of these, you know, fill in the blanks, walking, you know, around our communities, et cetera, et cetera. I'm hopeful that the the people on the jury, because I, I don't know what the, um, maybe you know, Dave, what the jury makeup is if they said, you know, how many of the 12 are male, female, uh, people of color, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that the jury is going to see through all of this and realize that this is not the appropriate way to deal with someone that's on your property. Now, you know, in this scenario, it's clear from where the casings were recovered that this was some distance away, right? There there were no, there was no gunshot residue or gun, a gunpowder residue, excuse me, on the victim's body, which indicates that this was a far distance away. So this is not a situation where there was a group of people that were approaching his house or approaching him personally and trying to attack him. These were folks that were way in the distance. And again, it doesn't make sense from the standpoint of he says he's firing warning shots, but you're finding all these casings, you know, right around that area. That that to me doesn't seem like warning shots that are going over someone's head. That seems to me that these are shots that are deliberately being fired at a group of people because of racial animus. Yes. And let's talk about that gunshot residue. You make a good point, Melba. Gunshot residue has been a real factor in this trial already because there was no gunshot residue and its absence suggests that the shot took place from far away, like 100 yards away, not some some uh, short range uh, shooting amongst uh, drug dealers and drug users. No, this looks like a long gun from far away. That's what the lack of gunshot residue speaks to. Now, the defense, though, then said, well, you know, we think it was rubbed off before testing, uh, because the samples were collected and people touched the body, it was in a cooler, and that's how it disappeared. That's why there's no gunshot residue. Again, I don't think it makes any sense what the defense is arguing, but it is enough if a juror wanted to say, you know what, I, I would do the same thing in that situation, and here's reason in my mind to find reasonable doubt, lack of gunshot residue, a question about the way the bullet entered and exited the body, could it have been from the long rifle or something much closer, they could find ways to acquit. And all it takes is one juror and it's a hung jury. Exactly, exactly. So that's that's the thing. And that's why the prosecution's really going to have to bring this home in closing to poke holes in all of the defense theories and to really tie up with a nice little pretty bow. Like, listen, there's no reasonable doubt here, right? Use your common sense. The truth does not change. The fact that the defendant gave multiple statements tells you already what time it is, right? So to really bring all of the key elements back to the jury and lay out why this is a second degree murder and if there's any enhancements that apply, that's you know separate issue in terms of uh, hate or bias motivation. But at least the basic second degree murder that, you know, this was a reckless and wanton disregard for human life, you know, whatever the case may be, and just, you know, really break that down for the jury so that they are under no illusions as to what really happened on that day. Right. And the prosecution has to be real vigilant to make sure that the defense doesn't go into politics because that's a conservative area. And if the defense goes into national politics and border policies, that plays right into the defense's hands and they tried to make this a macro issue instead of, no, look at the evidence right here, right now. These were unarmed individuals who were trespassing, but you can't shoot and kill trespassers. On the other hand, Melba, you know about this new law that Arizona is, is about to pass or will pass. Tell us about that. Yeah, so apparently Arizona Republicans have advanced a bill. Um, now the question is whether or not you know the governor is going to sign it, or you know what's going to happen, you know, in between now and you know 
in, in the next few weeks, but the Arizona Republicans passed a bill that literally would make it legal for you to shoot and kill somebody that is trespassing on your property, right? And while there was no mention of immigration, migrants, undocumented folks in the actual text of the bill, the rhetoric around it and the you know representatives in Arizona were clearly talking about this case and others are the reasons why this bill was very necessary in their mind, that people should have the ability to shoot an undocumented migrant if they're walking across their property and they used a lot of inflammatory rhetoric to justify why that was important. But again, so problematic because it's going to allow for extrajudicial action, right? So basically you don't need to call 911, you don't need to call law enforcement or border patrol or anybody, you can just take matters into your own hands. It's encouraging vigilanteism, which again is problematic. And if you want to be about law and order and all of that, well, vigilanteism is not part of law and order. Okay. So, you know, that that's incredibly problematic. So to bring it back to this trial, I hope that the prosecution, um, when filing motions around this trial, filed motions to say, listen, we need to restrict the defense from making this about immigration and border policy and just keep the focus on the actual facts of this instant case. And that's something that the judge can rule on and basically turn to the defense and say, okay, and you're opening the closing arguments, you have to stick with the facts of this case. You can't get into Biden this or, you know, the last president that or whatever the case may be. We got to keep it focused on the evidence. Yeah. So uh, what Melba is referring to, folks, is a motion in limine. And that is done before trial to make sure that the defense doesn't go into areas they shouldn't go into that would just do nothing but inflame the jury appeal to politics as opposed to the facts on the law. So I assume there was a, a, an order entered and the prosecution needs to be vigilant to object if the defense goes off the reservation, metaphorically speaking here. So that's where we are in this case. Melba, I appreciate your insights and this case is still in trial. We'll go back at it once we uh, get a verdict. It is uh, it is one that is of national concern because it just is more about true crime than it's politics. It's uh, the border policies. It's something that when we're facing a, a major election in November, this is the kind of case that resonates with the American public. So we shall see. So thank you for being here, Melba. We appreciate you. Thanks for having me, Dave. Until next time. Yes, until next time, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. True Crime MTN, the fastest growing true crime network. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next time.